this work is emerging from uh, a synthesis that Thomas Mueller and I worked up a few years ago uh, that tries to link movement mechanisms, resource dynamics, and the population level distributions that result. The idea is that different kind of movement mechanisms interacting with different kind of landscapes can, in certain combinations, lead to uh, a variety of these emergent population level distributions that we are talking about uh, today and, and at this conference. Uh, whether it's range residency, migration, uh, nomadism, uh, the interplay between mechanisms and dynamic landscapes lead to these distributions. When I talk about movement mechanisms, uh, there's a variety of things that come to mind, different categories of mechanisms that might come to play. One of the most complicated that was talked about in a few talks already here is spatial memory, where there's some information that's previous to the current state, whether it's coming from an individual's own history or from some genetic inheritance, that is informing the movement decisions. At the other end of the spectrum, very simple movement would be non-oriented movement, where there's some stimulus coming from the lo current location and it ends up uh, with a, a movement decision that has some random direction. So a very simple diffusive type movement would fit in the non-oriented category. Somewhere in the middle would be oriented movement. Uh, the idea that there's some food or good habitat that's been detected, uh, there's some stimuli that are stemming from someplace beyond the current position. What? This is important. All right, so there's oriented movement in the middle where there's some detection of food or good habitats. Uh, the stimuli informing the animal's decision to move are coming from outside, away from its current position. That translates into movement in a predictable direction. So depending upon what kind of literature you're reading, the kind of terms that correspond to this are advection or perceptual range or taxis. There's some other terms that fit in this category of oriented movement. Um, a good example of this pertaining to uh, ungulates uh, from our group is a paper in Physical Review Letters by Martinez Garcia et al. recently. Uh, the idea here is that information can be shared among individuals, that they can call to each other, and that this can inform the decision of where individuals may go uh, based upon collective information gathering. If you want to talk about that, uh, Justin Calabrese is in the back and you can, you can corner him. Um, a similar idea is sort of at the heart of the talk that I'm going to give today, where there's a perceptual range that an organism at the current location has some ability to detect and gather information from some distance around its current location. And that blue circle corresponds to the area over which that information is being gathered. Now inside that perceptual range you might have good habitat, it's green, it's good, let's stay and eat. It might be really bad, okay, it might get more complicated, it might be patches that might be informing the decision where to go. Or there might get even more complicated where there's missing components of that information due to some obstruction. Or they might be mistaken because the information they're getting is not accurate. Uh, or they'll be able to use some uh, internal mechanism like uh, accentuation of pheromones, for example, that might accentuate the particular value of a portion of the area inside that perceptual range. All kinds of different mechanisms complications can be included in this idea of information gathering uh, in the vicinity of a current location, where that vicinity is determined by that perceptual range R. So within this context then, two big questions. From a theoretical perspective, what type of landscapes does it pay to have large versus small perceptual ranges? When do we want to take advantage of the ability to get information from far beyond our current location? And second, how do those different kinds of movement mechanisms interact with landscapes to yield successful foraging? And what combinations are we likely to see this kind of oriented movement information gathering uh, be particularly useful? So to explore this, um, as a theoretician, we wanted to, uh, to look at this question using a movement model. And so our movement model here is represented with this equation here. It's a partial differential equation. 
Um, it is the idea that there's an equation that's governing movement based upon perceived resources. There's no reproduction in here. It's simply movement and redistribution. So U is the consumer population density. D is our diffusion coefficient. Alpha is the advection coefficient. And this function H is the perceived resource availability. That's the information on which the movement, directed movement, is being made. So to put this in the context, that first term on the right-hand side is the non-oriented movement. That's the diffusive component. On the, on the, the second term on the right-hand side is the oriented or, or the advective movement. And so we want to use this to represent the overall movement patterns that's taking place. So we now have to define that resource function H that's governing the information that's being obtained. And that's defined this way. Uh, we can think of this uh, equation operating in a single dimension where an individual is located at position X and it's gathering information at distance R on either side of its current location. And that's represented with that equation there, which has three key parts. The first is the radius of perception, capital R. We have the true resource function, M. And then we have something called a detectability function, which is the idea that the information coming in is warped in some way, whether it's warped advantageously based upon uh, an, abilities, an animal's ability to extract information from its landscape, or in, in, incorrectly uh, because it fails to understand the information coming in. So we can consider any of those kind of situations. But that function H, then, is our perceived resource, and the real resource is M. Okay? With this kind of a model, you have to specify some boundary conditions. These are pretty standard boundary conditions here. But we also have to define this, function, this uh, term omega, which is the idea that we want to capture foraging success. And so omega here, uh, this uh, ratio of integrals, is our metric of foraging success. And what that all boils down to is simply a measure of the spatiotemporal overlap of the consumers with their resources. That's just saying how they're juxtaposed relative to one another over space and time. Because the idea is if this is a consumer, it wants to be able to get resources, it needs to be where the resources are. And so that, that ratio of integrals gives you that measure of spatiotemporal overlap. OK, so now we can, having this model, we can ask the question, and what kind of landscapes does it pay to have large versus small perceptual ranges? So let's ask this about a simple landscape, one that is temporally constant but spatially variable. So you've got discrete patches. They don't change in quality. They don't change in position. They're just there. Okay? Is this kind of information gathering going to be useful in this landscape? The answer is pretty old. The answer is no, it's not going to be useful. Uh, the idea from Hastings, um, a couple decades ago is that an organism in this kind of a landscape can do the best at extracting resources by simply advecting up the resource gradient at a particular rate that corresponds um, to that ratio there of uh, the diffusion relative to the resource availability. The idea is that in this kind of a temporally static landscape, the organism does best by positioning itself relative to local conditions and it can do that best using local information. So can we take this idea and see how that works in this new model that we've con constructed? And what we can see here is that, yes, this idea does work up. The graph on the left there shows a temporally static landscape. You can see that there's a single patch resource um, that's available, and it stays in position and over time and doesn't change. Uh, but an organism foraging on that landscape, the foraging success, that, that integral, uh, ratio of integrals, uh, is going to be maximized when r equals 0. So it's not gathering information beyond its current location. It's simply reacting to conditions exactly where it is and following the local gradient. So that corresponds to that pre-existing theory. But what about a more realistic landscape, one where there's temporal variation going on? Well, here it really depends on the kind of variation and on the kinds of movement playing out on those different landscapes. This is where it gets interesting. Okay? So in a landscape here, we can think of a landscape where there's resources that are pulsed. They come in and they go away. Maybe it's a fruiting tree. It becomes available and then it goes away. And so that's what that graph on the left there is. There's one resource that's just pulsing in time. Okay? It's pulsing according in a, in a very special way. It's pulsing uh, according to a Gaussian distribution. 
which is defined by that equation. And you can see that the corresponding result from our model in terms of how omega depends upon the perception radius, basically that pulse just confuses things. And omega now is shifted smaller, but it doesn't change the fact that you still want to move based only on local information. You don't want to gather information from beyond, just based on move your movements on the local information only. All right, so that's a pretty simple kind of temporal variation. What happens if we speed it up? So now we have a faster change in the landscape. Well, that doesn't really change too much. Now we've got short versus long pulses. That doesn't change our omega function there in any way. Um, we could have an offset landscape. Now we have two pulses that are asynchronous with each other. This is like a migration landscape, you might think, where there's a resource pulsing, but it's out of sync at two different ends, two different poles of the migration. Okay? That just lowers the bar across the board. You still have that peak of omega at r equals zero, but the offset nature of the available resources doesn't change the idea that you don't want extra information. Still, you can do the best by just focusing on conditions immediately locally. Okay? So, as you make the dynamics more and more complicated, what you see there is the curve shifting lower and lower. So the movement based on strictly local information is no longer as advantageous. You don't have that steep slope in omega, but you still have the idea that omega is peaked at r equals zero. All right, so let's ask the question a little bit more uh, sophisticated way now and change things around so that we can explore different kind of movement mechanisms operating in the same landscape. Okay, and we can do this in a couple ways. First, we'll go back and we'll revisit that long pulsed Gaussian, that single pulse, resources pulsing up and down. But we're going to do two things. We're going to increase advection, that alpha term, and we're going to do so relative to diffusion. <laughs> and what this means is, in the context that I outlined earlier, we're increasing the importance of the oriented movement relative to the non-oriented movement. In other words, from a biological perspective, the consumer is now able to react more strongly to any resource gradient that it can perceive. So if it sees a pulse, it can get there quicker because it can follow the information toward that resource more quickly. Okay. Now we see something very different. So we have the same landscape from before, the single pulse, but now we have a situation where our omega function is peaking for a value of r that is greater than zero. Okay? So the foraging success is now somewhere to the right. You, here the, you can do the best in terms of overlapping with resources. If you're the consumers, your population will be achieve the best overlap with the resource distribution if you take advantage of non-local information. If you gather information from some radius around and then inf use that information to determine your, your movements. Okay? So we can, in this situation, by reacting to those peaks that are coming up and down, improve foraging success. Now let's make it a little bit harder to find those pulses. Um, so this is a situation where the resource pulse is not Gaussian anymore. It doesn't have those nice bell-shaped edges on it. Now we're going to talk about patches that are discrete in space. We're more as, as, mo as close as we can get to them mathematically and still have a, a nice continuous function. The idea is that you're going to have a patch with sharp edges biologically. There's a patch out there, but it's harder to see unless you don't have any information that the patch is there if you're away from that patch. Okay. So there's a patch with sharp edges. It's hard to detect that resource pulse. You have to be within your perceptual range in order to know that it's there, pretty much. Okay. We can do this mathematically with a pulsed square wave. Okay. It looks kind of like the system we had before, but now we've got these sharp edges on the pulse. Okay. And look what happens. Now we can accentuate the value of that information gathering. That perceptual range bigger than zero really makes a difference here in terms of how much overlap there can be between the consumers and their resources. When the patches are discrete, they're hard to find, 
the resources peak sharply and they do so for r greater than zero. Okay? It's even more than that. The faster you go, those different curves there represent different combinations of diffusion and advection. When alpha is big relative to diffusion, you're reacting faster and faster to the resource um, in an oriented fashion. So the, the larger values of alpha correspond to faster advection. But that's also mapping on there with larger peaks of R. So in other words, the faster you can move in response to resources being available, the bigger the perceptual range that you can use and exploit successfully to overlap spatially and temporally with the resources. So the takeaways from this work, non-local information can sometimes facilitate consumer overlap with resources. It's valuable in temporally dynamic landscapes where resources are hard to find. Okay? It's especially valuable when consumers can react quickly, that is they can advect mathematically, uh, quickly toward the resource peaks that are transient in time and space. Okay? So the, the idea here is that we have some delineation then of when we want to be using non-oriented movement to maximize overlap with a resource. In a dynamic landscape, the game is very different than in a static landscape. You have to be able to react to the changing conditions, and this gives some ideas as to when that non-local information can be particularly useful. So going forward, we can do things like add population growth to this model if we want to. We use it to test for conditions for persistence or extinction of the population. But the key thing here is that this gives us a path to identifying when this perceptual range, and in particular, the size of the perceptual range relative to the dynamics of the landscape, are going to maximize consumer resource overlap. So with that, I'll stop and acknowledge uh, the collaborators on the project that are um, involved in the larger work effort here on animal movement and funding from uh, National Science Foundation. Right, so um, no, we I mean you could think of that function g corresponding to a cost function as well, because in other words, you're detecting the information, but its value to you within your perceptual range may be lower because how hard it is to get to it. So that's the context in which we could explore that question, but this is not a physiological model that's trying to build that that in explicitly. Yeah. That's a trade-off between movement rate and perception. Yeah, so that you could you could structure it that way. Tie the per yeah, John. <laughs> Right, okay. Yep. Justin? 
Right. Okay. Yeah. That's that's this that's how this is working, yes. So so can't you just summarize all of this to how much information you have at different scales? That's that's basically the scale of discipline, right? Because it's successful to increase scale. The scale of which you can actually take and perform it over that range to go with the 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 time the range of the Because here you're kind of sensitive to how many passes do I have in How many passes do you have in this range? Well, you have, a, it, it, it's the integral, so it has to do with the information that's out there. And so that the fact that you're taking the ratio of those integrals uh, means that you can have anything in there to, char to characterize the distribution of resources. And so that, that, that ratio could be very complicated if you weren't interested in the numerical.